All right, the recording is going. Uh, so our first presenter on our composting basics uh, workshop this afternoon is Lisa House. So Lisa works for the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council, coordinating the Saskatoon compost coaches on behalf of the city of Saskatoon. Job titles aside, Lisa is a self-proclaimed soil nerd who grew up on a farm and is deeply passionate about growing food in urban spaces. Um, Lisa is my number one composting mentor in all of the work that I have done in gardens. I really appreciate her and all the work that she does throughout the city. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from Lisa on some of the best tips for composting. I know she's got a lot of good ideas for us um, right now heading into the spring. So welcome, Lisa. I'm just gonna mute myself and you can take it away. All right. Thank you so much. That's such a kind introduction. Um, so I, yeah, my name is Lisa. I'm with the Compost Coaches and I'm here to talk about Compost 101. I'm just going to quickly share my screen uh, so to make it that folks can see my PowerPoint presentation. So let me just check with this. Oh, Anna, the, I'm going to need to be, have the ability to share screen. Is it possible to, to add that to me? Um, there we go. What prompt service? All right. Uh, so now, hopefully, everyone is able to see uh, the screen there, um, and I will uh, get started. So absolute simple, uh, simplest definition that we can come to, what is composting? Composting is when we take food scraps and plants and let them rot back into soil. Of course, this is very similar to like natural processes that are happening all around us all the time. Leaves that drop from trees, plants that finish their life cycle and die, even animals that finish their life cycle and die. All of them are reprocessed by the microbes in the environment and turned back into soil so that they can then grow another generation of plants and et cetera. So it just keeps going in an endless loop. Composting, the word composting is usually used to talk about when humans are doing it on purpose and we try to do it as quickly and as simply as possible. Most commonly, people tend to use a compost bin. This is when people think of composting, a compost bin is the first thing that tends to come to mind. Uh, and they can be made in a variety of ways or purchased. There's a lot of different compost bin varieties available out there. They are, in the end, really just a sturdy container to keep things neat and tidy. They, don't, they aren't a vital part of the process other than just keeping things neat and sometimes keeping things just a little bit warmer and more insulated, uh, but they aren't magic. The process happens with or without the bin. Um, there are other ways to compost as well, which work just as well, but they all have certain circumstances that they're more suited to, uh, such as a trench compost, which is where you take a little bit of unused garden space and you bury your food waste there or your food and yard waste there. Or, uh, yeah, uh, some other ways include um, vermicomposting, which is a very interesting one. It's done typically in a small tub and you have red wiggler earthworms in that tub. Some newspaper, some red wiggler earthworms and some food waste and they are very well behaved. They stay right in the container. They eat the food waste and they make some amazing black compost. That one's very nice for indoors, including apartments, offices or classrooms. Um, Another way that's not pictured on here that I'll just mention briefly is called Bokashi composting. That's B-O-K-A-S-H-I. And that is a type of composting that actually has two steps. And in the first one, materials are fermented inside of a sealed container, very typically a five gallon bucket. Uh, and this careful, not uh, careful is the wrong word, but a specific kind of fermentation is used to uh, pre-process the food waste. And then it's composted normally in a trench compost or regular compost bin. Um, so this, these are just a few of the methods. There's even more as well. Today, we're gonna be focusing on bin composting and heap composting, which is the same thing. Um, if anybody is really interested in one of these alternative methods or other methods that are available for composting, feel free to reach out to the Saskatoon Compost Coaches after the session. And we will be really happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one or in a small group uh, to learn more of the details of one of the other methods. Okay, so in a compost, what is actually making the materials change? How do we go from a pristine banana peel or apple core back into some nice crumbly dirt? The short answer is that it's being done by microbes. 
uh, decomposition microbes from the environment are eating things and breaking them down. Um, the most two, <laughs> the two most common categories are bacteria and fungus. There are a few other things going on as well, but those are the big ones. So bacteria typically live as single-celled organisms uh, and they're found just everywhere. Um, there are billions of kinds of bacteria in the world, maybe more. Uh, and uh, some of them do make us sick. Some of them are dangerous, things like salmonella or E. coli, but there is a whole lot that are neutral or positive for us as well. And it's a lot of those neutral ones and beneficial ones that are doing the decomposition and compost. Uh, fungi, meanwhile, uh, it grows in little, long, microscopic threads through soil and decomposing organic matter. Um, and it will sometimes come to the edge or the surface of the soil or the matter and pop up a fruiting body that we can recognize, which is to say sometimes it'll come up and make a mushroom. So a mushroom is the top, the physical portion of, of a fungus, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg. And most of the magic is happening underneath the surface. Bacteria is really good at eating soft stuff, like that fruit, those, those um, apple cores and banana peels, all of our softer waste. And fungus is really, really good at breaking down tough stuff like wood and, and straw. And these are the guys doing the work in our compost bin. There are some larger things that are also helping the process. Uh, everything from little tiny nematodes to things like springtails and pill bugs, and of course, uh, the king of the heap, the earthworm. I will mention earthworms, when they are present in soil, are generally very beneficial. They're extremely good at changing organic waste from more complex forms back into soil, which can be used by plants. Um, they aren't native in every biome, and specifically because we saw at the beginning that we have people from different places in the country here today. I will mention that in northern biomes, anywhere that you're in sort of the, um, uh, the coniferous forests of Saskatchewan and further north, earthworms are actually not native there. They were killed off in the last ice age and they're no longer present in large numbers. Um, so if you don't see earthworms in your northern forests, do not worry, that is appropriate. Uh, however, if you're around in the grasslands or the mixed boreal forests, you can pretty much always expect to find them in healthy soil. Um, make sure to add lots of organic matter so they don't run out and they will keep your soil crumbly and nice uh, and good to work with. We have had some reports uh, which we read up on, and it's a real thing, that if your soil is very low in organic matter, then you can have some trouble with earthworms causing it to become a bit compacted. But the solution in that case is never to get rid of the earthworms, it's to add more organic matter. So just dump a couple of bags of leaves on top. That's an aside, just to mention, but these guys are also helping us in the compost bin. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the specific benefits of composting. And the reason I do this is that I find uh, that most grown-ups have sort of a fuzzy idea that composting is good for the garden or the environment or maybe both, but they don't really know why. So I'm just briefly going to go through what it actually is that composting is good for. And then we're going to talk about uh, the basic recipe for composting in a bin or a heap without any problems. So the three simple reasons we like to talk about, one is just to make a lot less garbage. Second one, which we'll explain in detail, is so less pollution comes out of the landfill. And the final one, which is the one that all the gardeners, including me, are excited about, is to improve the soil and grow healthier plants. Oh, and the relatedly to that is to restore the soil's ecosystem. These two points are closely interrelated. Okay. So the most simple and straightforward thing that composting does is that it helps us make less trash. And that's simply because uh, organic matter, which is to say things that used to be alive or living, so things like food waste uh, and yard waste, leaves, grass, even cut down trees and that kind of thing. Uh, some categories include soiled paper, like paper towels and pizza boxes as well. This stuff can make up an enormous chunk of a city's garbage our community's garbage. Um, in Saskatoon, they did a waste survey back in 2016 to try to find sort of the, uh, the breakdown of what was being thrown away by different segments of the city, including industries and businesses and, and residential areas. Uh, and for a single family um, detached residence, which is a really fancy technical way to say a family living in a house who weren't composting at home, the average number they found 
uh, was that 58% of what they were throwing away was actually compostable material like food scraps and yard waste. So that's a huge chunk of what was in their black bin. Uh, the number's a little bit lower for apartments and condos and things like that, but it was still about 40%. We throw away a surprising amount of food waste, it turns out. Uh, and so uh, between that and also what's coming from restaurants and institutions, uh, if we're able to take that chunk out of the trash stream, it just means that there's a lot less garbage that needs to be picked up, needs to be moved, and needs to go all of the way to the landfill, or in some places in the country, the transfer station. Um, this has a very practical benefit. It lets, comp it lets communities, uh, whether you're an RM or a big city, it lets them save money. Uh, it turns out that dealing with garbage is very expensive for, um, for any community, both in terms of storage as a transfer station or final resting place with a landfill, plus the cost of the trucks and the containers and the pickup schedule. Uh, and the less garbage there is to be picked up, the more municipal funds are freed up to use for other useful things, anything from road repair to community programs. So in my opinion, the less money we have to spend on garbage, the better. A second thing is about making less pollution in the landfill. So this is something that a lot of people don't actually know about. Uh, it turns out that things don't rot the same under all circumstances. And in particular, uh, organic materials don't break down very well if they don't have access to fresh air. Uh, because all of the microbes I showed before, the bacteria and the fungus, the useful ones all breathe oxygen. Um, when something is stuck in an oxygen starved environment, like a landfill where it is all packed down and covered over, um, it rots very slowly. It can take decades for something like a, even like a head of lettuce to break down. Uh, and in that time, as it's very slowly breaking down in this anaerobic environment, unfortunately, it's also making a lot of byproducts that we don't like very much. Uh, the biggest one that's talked about the most is methane gas. Uh, methane is a greenhouse gas, which will slowly seep out of the top of the landfill and get into the air, contributing, unfortunately, to climate change. Uh, methane is less common than carbon dioxide, but a lot stronger in terms of its warming ability. It's, um, I'm forgetting the exact number, it's somewhere between 20 and 40 times stronger than carbon dioxide. Um, and so we like to avoid causing that if possible, uh, both to mitigate our climate strategy and also to just kind of make it easier to manage the landfill if not all that is being formed. Uh, the nice thing is that when we make sure that the food waste and yard waste and other organic matter ends up in a system that has lots of air, like say a compost, um, then it breaks down very quickly. It only takes it a few months rather than multiple years or decades. Um, and while it does still release a little bit of carbon dioxide through the process of decomposition, that doesn't actually seem to be at all avoidable. It is simply a part of any living thing breaking down on the earth. Uh, and the amount is fairly small. It doesn't make any methane and it keeps most of the carbon sequestered in the finished product. So overall for the environment, this is a very good option. Oh, uh, right, I have an extra slide. The reason is because the microbes and other helpful creatures that are supposed to make the compost break down in the right way need fresh air to breathe. And they get that in a compost bin, they get that in a big industrial compost site, anywhere that we're composting, we make sure it has air. Uh, but in a landfill, things are packed down very tightly and covered up very deeply, so they don't have that air. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about it a little bit from the gardener side of things. Uh, so the reason that as a gardener, I really like to make compost is because it improves the soil in a whole host of ways. Compost is the closest thing to a, um, what's it called? A panacea, a cure-all as, as we get when it comes to soil, because it is full of nutrients, um, both the big three, that's potassium and nitrogen and phosphorus, um, but also lots of micronutrients as well. It's kind of like a multivitamin. Uh, and it also doesn't have them available all at once, which turns out to be a good thing. The nutrients in compost are tied up in fairly stable molecules, and then they're released a little bit at a time as microbes in the soil break them down. Um, that means that you can add a lot of compost in one go without causing something like nitrogen burn for your garden plants. Uh, and it also means that you can only, you can add composting frequently and it will still fertilize your plants steadily over many years. 
uh, unlike something that's water soluble, um, such as, you know, a brand like miracle Grow, where you would dissolve it in water and give it to your plants. And it's all available at once, but it's kind of a quick, short burst of energy that they use up and which is then gone in a few weeks. Um, I like to say it's the difference between sitting somebody down for a three course meal and handing a runner a shot of Gatorade as they're on the road. Uh, the second thing that compost is really good for is changing the texture of soil. Um, if you have really loose, sandy soil, compost actually helps to start to bind the particles together and make it a little more uh, clumpy, so it's not quite so fine. Uh, when you have really dense clay soil, the fluffy, organ and fluffy, irregularly shaped organic matter in compost actually helps to loosen it up. So either way, it takes soil closer to a loam texture, which is what we are aiming for in a nice, healthy garden. Um, the final thing, is that compost does a huge deal for helping with moisture in the soil. Specifically, it both helps moisture to infiltrate in, so you get less flooding and ponding during a heavy rain on your clay soil because it helps it to sink in really quickly. Uh, and the second thing is that it helps the soil to hang on to that moisture. Uh, so basically in a big rain, lots of water gets soaked up by the compost in the soil. So there isn't a lot of puddling and ponding and flooding. And then it hangs on to that over the next um, coming days and weeks so that the soil doesn't dry out very quickly after the rain stops. Uh, this means that we can water more deeply and less often, which is very, very good both for saving water and for growing healthy plants. I have an example picture here, uh, which is just to remind me to mention something that in spite of the fact that compost is really, really excellent for helping the soil in a variety of ways, that doesn't mean that every plant will want to grow in the compost before it is finished and mature. Compost that is still actively breaking down is a little bit of an intense acidic environment. It gets back to a neutral pH when it's finished, but during the breakdown process, a lot of little delicate seedling plants don't really want to grow in it. A lot of um, seed like watercress won't want to sprout in it um, until it's finished. But there are exceptions to that rule. There's a couple of families of plants that have completely uh, adapted to living in the rough and tumble environment of active compost. And this is a picture of one of them. It's a pumpkin. Everything in the squash family can be planted into unfinished, half finished, fresh compost, and it will probably still grow and flourish. So one thing that some gardeners will do to double up on space is that wherever their compost heap or their compost bin is, uh, in the spring, they will actually seed some pumpkins into it and just let them grow all over the heap. It's a, it's a neat thing called a grow heap, and it's a, just a, a fun way to double up on functions in the space. All right, uh, the final thing, which is to do with uh, compost rebuilding an ecosystem, is that if we're coming into a space that has fairly degraded soil, say it's been used very intensively uh, for conventional agriculture without much um, regards for the soil health over time, and the soil is therefore pretty degraded, doesn't have a lot of organic material left. There are some ranch lands that have fairly degraded soil as well. This could also apply to industrial environments, places where a big construction was done and all the topsoil was scraped away or something like that. But anywhere where we have soil that is just not very healthy, we can really start to rebuild it by adding um, just an inch of compost over the whole area. Uh, in fact, this works so well that they have been doing some very long-term experiments. They've been running for 25, 30, 40 years uh, where they measure the health of the soil over time after a couple initial applications of compost. And it turns out that the first couple applications of compost started a positive spiral of a feedback loop of benefits where the soil, even though they weren't adding more compost at this point, they just did it at the beginning, the soil was getting better and better and richer and richer with more organic matter over time. Uh, this works so well, to repeat myself, uh, that it's actually a field of climate change mitigation studies called carbon farming, uh, where they talk about restoring soil in order to sequester more carbon. So if anybody feels intrigued by that concept and wants to learn more about how uh, excess carbon can be stored in nice healthy soil, I would definitely look up some videos on carbon farming. It's a really interesting, really refreshing rabbit hole to sink into. Okay. So that brings me to the end of the benefits section. To recap, it was making less garbage, which saves money, uh, avoiding making methane and other kinds of pollution at the landfill because they don't have enough air there, uh, and finally improving the nutrients, texture, and moisture of the soil.
Now I'm going to talk about options. I am going to start with a couple of options that are Saskatoon specific, uh, but then I'll get into uh, the, the method, the five step foolproof recipe for uh, bin composting at home. All right, so a first option for Saskatoon is that we do have two compost depots. These are free drop-off sites where residents can take their yard waste. So things like grass, leaves, uh, trees, branches, garden plants. Do be careful about elm wood because of the control of Dutch elm disease. They don't actually want to take elm wood, but everything else they will take. Uh, and you can drop it off for free. They are open from May until November. You can always find their hours, locations, and everything else online. Just search for the Saskatoon Compost Depot. One is on the west side out uh, 11th Street, the intersection of 11th Street and Highway 7. The other is out the east side on College Drive all the way out by Zimmerman Road. Uh, and the two of them, um, as I said, dropping things off are free. The West Side Depot is nice because they also have a pile of complete mature compost and wood chips, not mixed together, two separate piles, one of wood chips, one of compost, uh, and that residents can actually take up to a cubic yard of one or both for free. So you can show up, drop off your bags of grass clippings, fill up a couple of tubs of compost and take it home to your garden all in one trip. It's very nice. Uh, a second option in Saskatoon is that we do have a green cart program available. Uh, it's unfortunately not available to everyone right now. Uh, currently it caters to uh, single family households, which is to say houses that already have the individual blue bin and black bin. It's not currently available to apartments and other places that use the communal uh, blue recycling dumpster and uh, black garbage dumpers, dumpster. Um, which I think is unfortunate because apartments could really use an organic pickup. The good news is the city is thinking of expanding it to include apartments and eventually also institutions such as schools and things like that uh, in 2023. So that is coming. Uh, at the moment though, it is a opt-in subscription program just for houses. And if you pay them the fee at the start of the year, I believe if you register before the end of April, it is $65 for one year. Uh, then they will bring you a green cart, they will pick it up every two weeks, and you can put all of your food waste and yard waste into it. Um, while it is seasonal and that it's only picked up from May to November, uh, it is typically left at people's house over the winter, and it is the official Saskatoon policy that you're allowed to keep putting your stuff in over the winter, and it will just be picked up in the next spring. So that's the green cart system. Now I'm going to talk about composting at home, which you can do anywhere. So in this picture, we have three compost bins, um, well, two types of compost bins, but they're all purchased compost bins. These are some of the typical black plastic compost bins that you might get in your local gardening store. Uh, the first picture of a compost bin that I shared in this PowerPoint, if people remember, was more of a homemade wooden affair. Again, Compost bins are just a sturdy container to hold your stuff. So they can be made out of anything non-toxic as long as it's in a good style for adding and harvesting later. So plastic is okay, uh, wood is okay, cinder blocks are always okay. You could use uh, chicken wire or other sheets of metal uh, to build your own. There is a lot of different ways that you can put your compost bin together. To compost well, uh, what we're wanting to do is create just the right mix so that the microbes that we like can get to work. So that's some helpful bacteria on the left and some helpful fungus on the right. And our five-step recipe for a foolproof concept, compost, is made to create just the right environment for these guys to thrive while creating not the best environment for their competitors. The right mix has five parts. Don't worry about reading all of this little writing super fast because we're gonna go into each of these in detail. But basically we are trying to balance something called green material with something called brown material. And then we're adding a little bit of soil, enough moisture to keep it damp and some air. green material. So about half of what goes into our compost bin or compost heap ideally should be green material. What this means, it's not literally the color that it is, although it sometimes correlates, is green material is the fresh stuff that rots more quickly. Um, chemically, it's things that are high in nitrogen, um, but it's the sort of stuff that if you left it out on your counter for a few days, it would get quite gross. Um, the basics of what's in this category are 
food waste, green plants, and grass clippings. If you live out in the country, you might include some, some livestock manure as well. All of this is high in nitrogen, and you can think of it as the fuel that really gets the compost going and helps it to break down. Um, the only issue is if our compost bin is mostly or entirely filled with green material, then we tend to have too much nitrogen present and it starts forming stinky compounds like ammonia. So if we have all green material, we end up with a compost bin that's too wet and dense and smelly. That's why we don't want it to be 100% of what's in there. When it comes to food waste, we are generally sticking to things from plants because they break down quickly and easily without any strong smells. So things like fruits and vegetables, any scraps or pits or peels or the whole thing if it goes moldy. Um, and that's a point to say, because people sometimes ask this, if you have some, some food waste that's gone quite moldy, it's still perfectly safe to put it in. That just means it's getting a head start on the breakdown process. Um, you can also put in your waste from making coffee or tea. Luckily with coffee, if you're doing it in a paper filter, the whole paper filter can go in as well. Same with a paper tea bag. Um, Eggshells are, oh, <laughs> eggshells are the exception in that they are an animal product, which is still really excellent to go in the compost. You don't really need to rinse them. You can just throw in the eggshell. Uh, they don't rot in exactly the same way as the other food waste. They almost act like little thin pieces of rock and they just very slowly dissolve over time. So in your finished compost, if you're adding eggshells to your compost at the beginning, your finished compost is still going to have eggshells present in it. They're very very good for the soil though. Some people, because of the way eggshells don't really rot, but just slowly break down like small pieces of rocks, some people just put them directly into their garden. That's actually okay too. Uh, you can do either one. So in addition to eggshells, fruits and vegetables, coffee and tea waste, um, your food waste, that it counts also uh, things that are made with flour or seeds little bits of bread or pasta or cereal that are too stale or moldy to be eaten can go in. Um, those are the main ones uh, other than uh, the vegetables and the coffee and tea waste. The stuff that we generally don't put into our compost are things that are high in grease or protein. So that's stuff like meat and bones and dairy and a fried egg or any part of the inside of the egg. Uh, it can also include really greasy but plant-based stuff like peanut butter or cooking oil. And the reason that we tend to leave out stuff that's really high in grease or protein is while eventually it would finally decompose at some point, it takes it longer. Uh, grease is quite hard for bacteria to break down uh, and it has a bad smell while it breaks down. Um, the smell of decomposing grease and protein can be quite uh, instinctively gross to humans. So you can annoy yourself and your neighbors. And at the same time, it's instinctively quite attractive to most animals. So you can get trouble with anything from skunks to raccoons to coyotes to mice if you're adding a lot of greasy protein rich stuff. So that's why we generally don't. We would still put those things in the garbage can um, and just stick to putting things like fruits and vegetables and coffee and tea into our little compost container in the kitchen. That's how it's generally done by the, by the way, is that people who are composting at home will have a bowl or an ice cream pail or some sort of a small or medium container with a lid on their kitchen counter and they'll put their scraps in there throughout the day and empty it into their outdoor compost bin every couple of days. Okay, so to recap, green material, it is food waste and green plants and grass clippings, and we want it to be about half of what is in that compost bin because it is a great fuel for compost, but it smells a little bit if it's all we have in there. The other half of the compost bin, oh, sorry, is supposed to be brown materials. So again, this sometimes correlates to the color, but not always. Uh, it asks for dry and dead and woody and weathered. So uh, things where the life and freshness is basically all gone. We'll talk about stuff like wood chips or twigs or sawdust, things like straw or brown plants. Um, newspaper is common, cardboard is common, uh, and probably the most common one of all is leaves because you can store them up in the fall, keep a few bags of leaves around, and then use them to balance your compost the entire following year. 
Uh, I mentioned cardboard and newspaper. You can also use other types of soiled paper products as well, like your pizza boxes or napkins or anything that's got a little bit of food material on it so it's not very good for recycling anymore. We want the brown material to be about half of what's in our compost bin. So often we will layer it with the green material. The simplest way to do that usually is to have a bag or two of brown material around, store it up, since it's pretty stable on its own, doesn't break down very fast. And when you add some green material to your compost bin, then just take a scoop of about the same amount of brown material and dump it on top. That way they'll always be layered up together and mixed together and balanced out. Uh, the things about brown material, one is that it's fairly low in nitrogen and high in carbon. Uh, it also tends to be a little chunkier and tougher than the soft green material, so it helps to keep air spaces open as well. And that, uh, oh, and the last thing to say is that the reason we wouldn't want a compost bin entirely filled with brown material and no green material is that it breaks down very slowly on its own. So we want to have the green material to make sure things actually break down in any reasonable amount of time and the brown material to keep air spaces open and even out the nitrogen so that it doesn't have a bad smell. And those two together are the most important part of getting your compost to break down quickly and without any odors. Okay, moving on. This is, as I've been saying, always balance your greens and your browns to prevent bad smells and keeps things breaking down quickly. Oh, one thing that I will mention quickly about food waste, uh, just a, well, actually about green materials in general, there's a few items that people sometimes ask, can you add this? Can you add this? Can you add this? Because there are um, bits of folk wisdom floating around that some things are bad for the compost. Uh, you can add onions, absolutely. Everything in the onion family is fine. You can add citrus. Everything in the citrus family is also fine. You can add rhubarb leaves. They're poisonous for humans to eat, but they don't cause problems in the compost and they'll be fully broken down and all of the chemicals will be gone uh, by the time that it is finished. Um, you can use pine needles and anything from a pine or a spruce tree. Some of these things just break down a little slower because they're a bit antibacterial to start with, but all of them will decompose into soil. Okay, so after we have half greens and half browns, then what are we worried about? Uh, the next thing that we add is just a little dash of soil. And for this, we're looking for soil that is literally just from the ground or from an existing garden bed. We're not really looking for potting soil from a bag because what we're adding the soil for is that we want some of the decomposition microbes that are living it. And potting soil is often sterile. So that's the opposite of what we're looking for. Uh, you don't need to add much soil. In fact, technically you don't need to add any, it is optional, but things work better if they have a little dash of soil thrown in there every month or couple of months. So just half a shovel full or a handful or two and the decomposition microbes in that, uh, we say it's a lot like adding a bit of sourdough starter to a fresh batch of dough. It just gets it going. The fourth one is water. And this is so important in a prairie climate. Um, we do a home visit program, a few free home visit program in Saskatoon, where anybody who's, well, either wanting to get started composting or somebody who is composting, but they need a little help figuring out what's going wrong. Uh, we have a free home visit program in Saskatoon. And uh, we'd say the biggest thing that comes up for folks in terms of people who are having trouble at home, is just that they didn't know that you have to add water and their compost got all dried out and then it stopped breaking down because that's how it works. Uh, compost actually has to be damp to decompose. The microbes can't eat anything unless there's water present. Um, so if our compost gets totally dry, which without additions of water in Saskatchewan's climate, it absolutely will at some point in the summer, uh, then it just stops. It, uh, it goes into hibernation, basically. The good news is none of the microbes are dead and all you have to do to restart it is add some water. Uh, so it's not like watering a garden 
in that if you forget for a few weeks, nothing's going to die. Uh, but uh, if you want things to be breaking down quickly, then it's a good idea to maybe go out, check the moisture. If it's not damp, then add a couple buckets of water, maybe every uh, two weeks or every month during the summer. Two weeks is a really good rule of thumb. You can do it more often if you're out there more often, and you can do it less often if you're quite busy. Uh, for this, if you have it, rainwater is great. Rain barrels are wonderful uh, because your, the microbes in your compost bin do not need treated chlorinated city water. It isn't of any benefit to them. Uh, plus, rainwater doesn't cost anything. So it's just a nice time to use a, a bucket of scummy water from the rain barrel. Last thing. So in our recipe of green material, brown material, some dirt, and some water, the last item is air. And we talked a little bit about how this makes the difference between the slow and kind of pollution filled decomposition in a landfill and the faster, cleaner decomposition in a compost bin. So most compost bins and obviously all compost heaps get a fair amount of air to the edges of the compost. So uh, with a heap, it's because it's just exposed to the air. So the edges always have lots. With bins, they tend to have some gaps or vents around the outside where extra air can get in. So the edges are fine. Um, but sometimes we need to think a little bit about what's going on at the center of the compost pile, where it's as far as possible from all of the edges. In larger compost piles, and especially ones that are currently in really active decomposition, so they're breaking down quickly, uh, the microbes can breathe up all of the air and run out. Uh, and so what we would want to do to make sure everything keeps breaking down quickly with lots of oxygen is do something to help air get to the center of the pile. A passive option, which is great if you don't have a lot of time or if you've got a shoulder injury or any reason that you don't want to have to actually fuss with the compost, is to get an aeration pipe. It's just a length of regular old plastic pipe that you can get from a hardware store or left over from a renovation or something like that. Take a drill and poke some holes in it all the way along. Uh, and then you put that into your compost pile so that at least one end or both are sticking out and it acts as a chimney or a drinking straw to let air get right into the center of the pile. Uh, a bonus thing about the pipes is if you are watering your compost with a hose, you can often just tuck the end of the hose into the top of the pipe and walk away and it'll water the compost uh, really nicely for you without the hose falling or dropping or flopping somewhere. Uh, the final one though, which is what a lot of people will do, is they'll give their compost a poke or a little stir every, every now and then. Uh, these two tools on the right are examples of stirring. Um, actually, these might be the same tool. The, the third one here, this is a compost aerator, which if you are using the type of compost bin that opens from the top, which most store compost bins are, so that you have to stir it vertically from the top down, I honestly think that it's absolutely worth it to shell out a little bit of extra money, often about $40, to get a compost aerator. It will make your life so much simpler. Uh, these are designed to stab down into the compost really easily without getting stuck. These wings on the bottom are folding wings, so they fold up while you're pushing it down, allowing it to really slide into the compost. And then when you pull it out again, the wings pop down and they stir everything up. It is so much easier to stir compost with one of these than with a shovel or a pitchfork. However, uh, if money is an issue, uh, sometimes people will also use something like a really pointy stick or a piece of rebar to just sort of poke some holes and fluff around in the compost instead. If you have a compost pile or the type of compost bin that opens from the front, such as a stall made out of cinder blocks or pallets, uh, then it can be actually really good to use a pitchfork or a shovel or some other type of a broad tool. It just doesn't work very well vertically. Uh, and if you are storing your compost, I would recommend ideally doing it about every two weeks. Again, you could do it even more often every week or even every few days. Um, and you can do it less often too, every month, every two months, or only a couple times a season. Even doing it once a season is better than doing it never. It's kind of a sliding scale of benefits. Um, in addition to adding lots of air to the pile, a second reason that stirring can be really useful uh, is that 
it is very helpful for deterring animals. Uh, and I'm going to get into that in a second. But first, just to answer a question in the chat, somebody was asking in Saskatoon where to get that kind of a stir tool. And I can answer that I believe they have them in stock at three places that I know of. There's probably more. So you can always ask at any other gardening or hardware store. But the three places I know of are Early's Farm and Garden Center, Lee Valley Tools, and PV Mart. Uh, again, feel free to ask other places, especially you can even probably get other folks to order them in. I'm not trying to advertise for those three stores. They're just the ones that we know about that have them currently. Okay, so avoiding animals. I use this picture as an extreme example for, from Northern Saskatchewan. That is in fact a grizzly bear, uh, but or um, unless my southerner eyes are completely deceiving me and it's actually a black bear. I think it's a grizzly bear. Anyway, point being uh, very far north, what they have to worry about most is bears and they have to build a very, very sturdy enclosure for their compost that cannot be gotten into. For most of us though, in, in middle and southern Saskatchewan, what we are worried about is rodents. A little bit of skunks and raccoons and coyotes and things, but mostly rodents because uh, while things like mice and, and, and voles and that don't harm compost and it's still so totally safe to use, uh, they aren't nice to have close to our buildings and our dwelling places. We just don't want to encourage them to live in large numbers in residential areas. Uh, and so the best way to keep the compost from being inviting to things like mice and voles is simply to keep it damp, very important, and stir it. If you stir it and keep it damp, it's almost, uh, well, we have so far in all of our, uh, in all of our home visits and all of our programs and all of our workshops and our personal experience, we have never seen a rodent in a bin that gets wet and stirred. We have only seen them in bins uh, that are dry and haven't been touched for many months or sometimes years. And the reason for that is um, a lot of times what rodents are looking for isn't actually food, it's shelter. They like compost bins or any yard structures because it's a place for them to hide and to build sort of a sheltered nest. And so if it's not dry and, and undisturbed, but if it's actually wet and getting stirred by humans all the time, it makes it feel like a hostile area and they don't move in. So that's my biggest advice in terms of uh, how to make sure that animals don't make a home in your compost bin. Although, uh, I can go even further there and say either if the even even the barest hint of a thought of a mouse gives you the heebie-jeebies or if you're living somewhere where due to other unfortunate circumstances there's already a big rodent problem uh, you might want to invest in a tumbling compost bin which is not just rodent resistant but rodent proof. Um, that's to say, sorry, tumbling bins in general are rodent proof. Those are the types of bins that are more barrel shaped or round and up on a stand and they spin. So you add your materials to this enclosed raised container uh, and it is actually not possible for the animals to get into it. So if you're living somewhere where mice are already a big problem, it can be really worth it to just invest in that right off the bat. Okay, so to recap, our special perfect recipe for making compost is half green material, half brown material, add just a little bit of soil every couple of months, add enough water to keep it damp, and stir it or add air in other ways every couple of weeks. And with that, you should end up with a compost pile that breaks down in somewhere between uh, two and four months. Might be a little bit longer if you put in a lot of tough material. Uh, and it shouldn't have any bad odors and it shouldn't have any pest problems. I'll talk about all of that a little bit more at the end. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about extra things you can do to put just a little bit of extra pizzazz in your composting and to help it break down even faster or even to help it get quite hot during the breakdown process. So other things that affect the compost are the size of the particles, specifically things that are chopped up more and in littler pieces and more pulverized pieces will break down faster than things that are whole or in large pieces. Uh, this is because it gives more surface area and entry points for the microbes to get in and start breaking it down. The second thing is the size of the pile. So it turns out that while smaller particle sizes work better, 
bigger piles also work better. So if you want to make a really fast, hot compost, uh, it's a good idea to get enough material together to make a compost that is at least a cubic meter in dimensions. Um, if you have just a little store compost bin, the plastic kind, you can cut, try just filling it up to the brim. That is not a full meter, but it is better than it only having a little bit in the bottom. Uh, if you're wanting to uh, make one, you can always make a, a square of pallets and then fill that up with compost material. And that is about the right size for an ideal compost pile. And the last thing is whether it is assembled all at once or just a little bit at a time. So for most of us, if we're composting just with our food scraps and our other materials from our homes, uh, then we will just be, you know, adding a bucket or two of materials every week or so, and we'll be filling, doing that continuously over time. That's great, works great. Uh, it's good for, uh, convenient for dealing with your home waste and you'll have sort of a steady stream of compost made over the season. But if your goal is to make compost really fast and really hot, it's much better to gather a whole bunch of materials in one go and put them all together in one go. So you would gather up three or four bags of grass clippings and three or four bags of leaves and mix them all together at once. And that will make a compost pile that breaks down fast and hot and uniformly. Uh, it's because there is more food available um, for the microbes at the beginning so they can really multiply and go nuts. So if you follow all of these, if you have chopped up small material and you have big piles and you add a whole bunch at once, you can get a very hot compost. Uh, heating in compost is caused by really, really active microbial decomposition. Basically when the microbes, when there's a ton of them present and they're very active, they're all metabolizing just a little bit of heat and all of them together can build up a whole lot of heat. Um, this picture, it wouldn't be just doing this spontaneously. They must have just turned this compost, exposing more of the hot parts to the air. But this does kind of show you how much heat can be coming off of a compost. Uh, you can absolutely get steam to come off of it. Um, because a really active compost can get up to 50 or 60 or even 70 degrees Celsius in the middle of the pile. Uh, that's really nice because you can use it to both make a compost that breaks down very fast and also make a compost that sterilizes any harmful pathogens if you're adding things that are a little more dangerous like cat or dog waste um, and also cook any weed seeds so they're not going to grow. Uh, so with this, you would be able to safely compost, like I said, like slight kind of dangerous stuff like dog waste at your own risk. Do not quote me on that. Um, and secondly, uh, things like thistles that have gone to seed or other kinds of persistent weeds. Um, uh, just to say, the, the rule of thumb, by the way, if you're trying to cook weed seeds or kill pathogens, is that you want your compost pile to reach 55 degrees Celsius for at least 40 eight hours. So 55 degrees Celsius, two days. If that's what you're trying to do and you want to keep it measured, then you can go again to one of the gardening stores and purchase a compost thermometer, which looks like a meat thermometer, but which with a much longer stem and you just stick it in there and it'll tell you exactly what the temperature in the middle of your pile is. So that's just if you're trying to monitor it. Um, if you specifically want to kill weed seeds, or if you're like me and you're just a big compost nerd and you really like watching the numbers go up because it makes you happy. So then you get a compost thermometer just so you can go out and check it and brag to your partner and be like, it reached 60 degrees today. And he can say, that's nice, dear. Um, anyway, maybe that's just me. Uh, this is completely optional. Compost can absolutely break down at ambient and cool temperatures and still get to a finished mature compost and still be wonderful for the garden. Hot composting is for cooking weed seeds, killing pathogens and going fast. Then for bragging rights, it's for all of those things. Um, if you are making hot compost, you can expect to see a spike in heating within the first couple of weeks of assembly, and it'll probably stay really hot for somewhere between a few days and a few weeks. And then if you have that compost thermometer, once you see the temperature starting to drop, that's when you stir it a little bit, add more air, and you'll see another heating bump, but not as high as the first one. And you might get one or two or three heating bumps, and then after that, you'd expect it to just go back to ambient temperature, because even really hot compost piles actually do still finish off their decomposition at regular air temperature. They don't stay hot the whole time. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about winter and a little bit about spring because it is the time. So in winter in a prairie climate, your compost bin absolutely will freeze. If you're doing it outside, it's going to freeze. 
that means the decomposition stops. The microbes don't die. They just go to sleep. They wake up in the spring. And when it warms up in the spring, everything starts again. So you can still add material over the winter. You just can't expect decomposition until spring. Um, you can kind of ignore putting in brown material in the winter uh, and just add your green material as you have it. But that does mean that in the spring, once it warms up, you're probably going to want to put a dump of brown material like leaves or newspaper on top, or it'll get a little bit sticky. Um, the reason that we might leave brown material out is that the main challenge of winter is things tend to fill up. That's because nothing is decomposing. It turns out that when compost is decomposing, it's also shrinking an awful lot. Finished compost is only about a quarter or a third as big as what went into it. Uh, and so that's why compost bins sometimes feel like magic in the summer that we can just keep filling them and filling them and filling them, but they never get full. But in the winter time, when stuff just freezes and doesn't decompose, they do get full. So sometimes people will avoid putting in brown materials over the winter just to have the maximum amount of space for green material. And then when it thaws out in the spring, a whole bunch more room is made and they put a bag of leaves on top. Alternatively, uh, if your compost bin gets completely full in the winter, mine always does somewhere around January, partly because we take some extra compost scraps from our neighbors. Uh, then we just put out a big storage tub or a garbage can with a lid and we start adding our food waste into that from then on in the winter. Uh, when things thaw out in the spring, there's room to add it all on top. Sometimes people will even just switch to the secondary container right away without even waiting for the compost bin to be full because they can put the secondary container just half a step outside of their back door and they don't actually have to walk all the way over to their compost bin when it's cold. Uh, so that's for the winter time. In the spring now for rebooting, these are the things I would think about. Keep an eye on your compost and when you see that it's pretty much getting thawed all the way through, um, it's a good time to give it a stir and add enough brown materials to balance it out. If you don't do that and you've been adding green material all winter, you might find that it's getting just a little bit stinky. So you want to put some brown materials in to bring it back into balance. Uh, give it a stir, add brown materials, and a nice thing you can do right now is if it's a little bit dry, this is a great time to just add a few shovelfuls of snow from a nearby snowbank on top, and as it melts, it'll sink in and water all of it. Um, those are the main things for spring. Uh, you should also find that it is, as, I'm say as I said, it should make a lot more room. I have at least one compost bin that as of uh, the middle of February was full right up to the brim and heaping, but out there today, it's about a third full because it just melted and it shrank away to almost nothing. Um, but uh, yeah, give it a stir, add brown materials, make sure it's wet, and uh, it will absolutely kick off. In fact, you might see quite a hot compost bin over the coming few weeks because all of the material from winter is ready for decomposition all at once. So it does the thing that I just mentioned about a pile that's assembled with lots of material at one time. Okay. Oh, if you didn't harvest compost last fall, uh, this spring would also be a good time to look. So at the, actually that might be my next slide. Haha, -ha, there we go. Okay, so when is compost finished? When is it ready? Compost is done when it's brown and crumbly um, and it smells like soil. So importantly, it shouldn't smell super sour or like manure. Both of those would mean that it could use a stir and to be put back uh, for a little bit more time. In terms of it being crumbly and brown, uh, you will still see bits of harder materials in your finished compost. You will absolutely still see eggshells. You will still see avocado pits and peach pits. You might see an, a, bit, a piece of an avocado skin. You probably see a few leaves that managed to escape the process, a bit of a wood chip or things like that. So don't see, don't, don't take the presence of little chunks of that case to, of that kind to mean that it is not ready to go. Uh, what you should shouldn't see is any of the soft stuff. You shouldn't see an apple core, a banana peel, a head of lettuce. Any of those softer things should be completely gone. Um, uh, and the last thing I was going to say about it is, oh yes, if you want your compost to look fine and perfect like it came from the store, what you have to do is put it through a metal screen, something with an inch or half inch holes uh, to screen out any of the big chunks. And then what comes through will look very fine and nice like it came from a bag from a store. 
that's not necessary for your plants. It doesn't help them in any way. Sometimes a fine compost though is useful for things like raking out onto a lawn or mixing into a potting mix or anywhere else where a fine mix is just practically helpful. Uh, otherwise though, it's absolutely just an aesthetic choice. Doesn't matter to your plants. In fact, the chunks can actually be good for the soil in that they act as long-term reservoirs of nutrients and microbes. Okay, in terms of when to harvest the compost, um, often people in a prairie climate will get into a rhythm of harvesting the compost about once a year. You could probably be, do two, or if you're really keen, even three harvests, but once a year is sort of the nice balance of uh, time to reward. Uh, so people will often try to harvest whatever finished compost they have in the spring before the plants are planted or in the fall when the plants are mostly done. Because both of those mean that you don't have to worry too much when you're scattering your compost around in the garden with making sure not to bury your plants. You absolutely can add compost in the middle of summer. You just want to, you know, put it around the plants and not directly on top of them. Um, in a tumbling compost bin, which is what they have in this picture, this is the inside of a tumbling compost bin, to get finished compost, it's a good idea to do some kind of a batch system, which is to say at some point stop adding to your compost and start putting your material in a different compost bin while the first bin finishes off. The reason for that is that tumbling compost bins are always blending up all of the materials. Uh, and so all the fresh stuff and all of the older stuff get mixed. And if you never stop adding, then you kind of have trouble getting a fully finished mix. Um, if you have the type of compost bin that just sits on the ground, then even if you are stirring it every couple of weeks, it still tends to stay in layers and the oldest stuff will be at the bottom. So most stationary compost bins have a little door at the bottom that you can lift up and then try to scrape some compost out with a shovel or a trowel. Do not trust the, ed the appearance of the edges of the compost to see if it's finished. The edges don't tend to look finished because they dry out faster than the middle, so they're often behind. Um, dig into the center to see if you've got finished compost because it's usually hiding. Um, if you don't want to use the little door or you find it too fussy, you can also do what I do, which is either to tip the whole compost bin over and dig at it from the bottom, or just lift the whole compost bin off the stack. Uh, <coughs> and you can expect this type of compost to be finished about halfway up, and then the rest of it to be too, too fresh. Okay, using finished compost is extremely simple in that anything that gets back in contact with the soil is going to work. So you can dig it into your soil if you want, if you're doing a till system. If you're doing a low till or no till system, um, you can absolutely just top dress with the compost, leave it on top of your soil. That's a very great way to do it as well. If you're using a lot of mulch, and mulch is awesome for a healthy garden, uh, you might wanna scrape the mulch back, put the compost down and then tuck it in with the mulch on top. That's a, that's a wonderful, system. Uh, you can also, of course, you can rake it into a lawn. Uh, don't put too much, only like a centimeter and rake it out onto a lawn. Or you can mix it half-half with old potting soil to refresh it. Um, you can put it in planting holes if you're planting a tree, but just anything that gets it back in contact with the dirt is going to work. Okay, that brings me basically wraps up what I'm going to say. I'm going to mention a couple of services and then I'm going to look at questions. Uh, and also, if you are coming up to this uh, in a few days and you're like, oh man, what did she say about leaves? What did she say about harvesting compost? I forget. You can always reach out to the Saskatoon Compost Coaches. We are very happy to answer folks' questions, even if you are from other places in the province. Okay. So one thing, if you do live in Saskatoon and you're thinking of buying a compost bin or a rain barrel or the materials to make a compost bin or a rain barrel, keep in mind that the city has a little financial incentive for that, just a little $20 rebate, uh, like a coupon on new compost bins and rain barrels or the materials. So you can go to swrc.ca slash rebate dash form for more info on that. Or you can just Google $20 rebate Saskatoon and it will pop up. Oh, thanks. I see that the link to our Facebook page has been shared in the chat. Uh, because yeah, the last thing is uh, the Saskatoon Compost Coaches, we do actually still do free home visits even in the era of COVID, but we only do them outdoors and socially distanced or, or we do them virtually. We can do either one. Uh, so do still feel free to uh, reach out. We only do the home visits for folks in Saskatoon. Folks out of Saskatoon have to make do with just asking us questions and getting an answer. 
Um, so this is our phone, this is our email, that's our Facebook, and as of a little while ago, we actually got ourselves an Instagram as well, which is just at Saskatoon Comp with Coaches. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for being here. I am going to look into the questions now. I see there are some things in the Q&A. Um, okay, so someone asked, what is the difference between compost and mulch? So uh, compost is decomposed uh organic matter things like food waste yard waste anything that used to be alive that's changed back into um, a fairly stable fluffy mix of uh, soil organic matter which is ready to go into uh, be mixed into regular soil and be helpful to plants again you can top dress with compost which is to say putting it on top of the soil which kind of technically counts as being a mulch sort of because what a mulch is is it's a layer of materials often not decomposed yet so like fresh wood chips fresh straw fresh leaves that are placed on top of the soil as a protective layer uh, to feed the soil and protect it from erosion and extreme uh, weather so soil that's got a layer of mulch on top say four or five inches of leaves the temperature in the soil changes more slowly so plants don't get so stressed out on hot days uh, it stays wet longer so things don't need to be watered as often uh, and it even helps reduce soil compaction when you're walking around it doesn't tamp the soil down as hard uh, and the last one being that uh, a good thick layer of mulch can keep a lot of weed seeds from germinating because they're not getting any light uh, and so you'll find that you don't have to do as much weeding in a mulchy system uh, on a more anecdotal level if you go out and look around in any kind of a natural ecosystem you'll notice that nature never really leaves bare dirt anywhere uh, it always covers it up even if it's just with a layer of decomposing leaf litter or something like that so mulch is really just a way to mimic the pattern of nature that bare soil is always covered up with some decomposing organic matter. Okay, next question. Uh, are there any plans to lobby the city to institute free green bin usage? Uh, yeah, uh, basically reach out to your counselor and tell them what's important to you. Um, it is definitely a, unfortunately being treated as a political issue in Saskatoon and some, some members of the council are all for it because they see it as more efficient and easier to use, uh, having a universal green bin that is, and some are against it because they say it would cost too much and it isn't what people want. If it's something that's important to you, absolutely reach out and say, no, I live here, I want this. Um, because uh, of course the, the thing that affects political issues the most is just when constituents make their, their needs and their opinions known. Uh, next, Thing. when should I stop adding to my compost bin so that it can mature? Okay, so I, I answered this a little bit. Oh, somebody, it, okay. I answered this a little bit, but um, uh, a compost bin that's sitting on the ground, so one where it's just stationary, it's not getting, turn, not getting um, spun like a barrel, uh, you don't ever have to stop adding to it. You will just put fresh stuff in the top and get finished stuff out the bottom. And it's like continuous flow through system. Uh, for a compost bin that's like a tumbler, the type that's always spinning like a barrel and mixing everything together, you would probably want to stop adding to it about two months before you take it out. Uh, so that does mean that a lot of times folks who are using a barrel system will either have two barrels or they'll have one barrel and one bin or something so that they can switch back and forth between the two to make batches. Uh, the next one is, do I need to add a variety of brown materials? Can I just use shredded paper and cardboard? That is an awesome question. You don't have to add a variety of brown material. You can just rely on one or one or two kinds. Um, shredded paper's only disadvantage is that it doesn't keep as much air spaces open as other things because wet paper is pretty soft. Um, but you can still absolutely do it. Just make sure to give it a little fluff or a stir every now and again so that it still has lots of air spaces open. Uh, and if you're mixing cardboard in, then you'll be fine. Um, you don't need to put it all through a shredding machine, um, although that's ideal because then it's in nice little pieces but you can also just tear things up with your hands as long as you've got the patience for it oh and i will mention there's only one kind of paper that's really recommended that you don't put in and that's the sort of really glossy smooth paper that you get into in magazines uh, because it has a lot crazier kinds of ink on it and it's not really made out of quite the same stuff as other paper other paper is pretty much fine 
Okay, last one. Do you have information, flyers, directed or aimed at workplaces? Nothing specifically for workplaces. Um, we do have uh, always free presentations available through the compost coaches. If you want to do something like a lunch and learn or have us meet with a couple higher ups and talk to them about composting at the workplace. We have general brochures that are just about compost, period, um, but none of them that are specifically like this is what your office could do. However, if you're interested in educational materials or other things, again, reach out to the compost coaches after the thing and we'll see what we can help you with. So those were the questions that I saw. Oh, there's another one. How, how I would adding a live culture such as kombucha to the compost help to boost the beneficial microbes? Oh, interesting. Um, I will admit I've never been asked this before. Okay. Um, Huh. I guess I can't answer because I don't know. It certainly wouldn't harm it. I can tell you that much. But as for whether it would have a specific acceleration uh, benefit for the compost, I would have to do some experiments or try to look into some reading around it. Um, as I say, the, the outcome would be somewhere from neutral to good. So I, I fully recommend having a look into it. Um, I will say compost accelerators are often sold in gardening stores and they tend to be a mix of one of two things. A little bit of nitrogen fertilizer because nitrogen is the fuel that gets compost to break down and some decomposition microbes. Um, I tend to say with those uh, purchased um, accelerants that it's a thing where you can buy them because they do work, but you don't have to because you can get all those things for free. You can get decomposition microbes from the soil. You can get nitrogen from any of your green materials. Um, but I would sort of probably put something like kombucha or other live uh, live um, cultures into the same category where you can add it, but you absolutely don't have to. Um, I would have to be more familiar as well with what the specific microorganisms in kombucha are. For example, if they're actually anaerobic organisms, and I, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough, then they would probably just end up neutral and not beneficial. But if they're aerobic, then they would probably be a benefit. Either way, though, that's a really interesting area of study, and you have intrigued me, and I will look into it later. Any other questions for today? Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.